So let me tell you what a framework is. If you go to a very remote part of the world where they are not scientific, if there is lightning, they don't know how to explain it. And they just think they have come up with all kinds of explanations, but nothing scientific. And they just react to it. And when they hear, see another lightning, then they react again. They do not have a framework of electricity. They do not understand that this is, this is how it's happening. They don't understand natural phenomena because they don't have a framework. Suppose somebody does not know the concept of a metro. And he comes and he sees that there is this big cement tower they're making. And he says, what is this all about? There's nothing on top. He's just making a big tower. Suppose there's a construction going on. And then a little bit later he goes, he sees another tower. It makes no sense to him because he does not understand that this is all part of a framework called Metro. So the framework you need to understand to understand some people's behavior. The Indianization of race. The Indianization of race. We don't have concept of race. We have concept of Jati, which is very different than race. Race, you know, the blacks came from a different con continent than the whites. You can tell who's which race. But Jati is... We are all Indians. All the Jatis are from here only. They look the same. They eat the same. So the imposition, the imposition of race onto Jati is the new thing. Which people here are not understanding very much. But it is spreading like wildfire. Dalits are the blacks of India. And non-Dalits are the whites of India. And caste is like racism. This is the new critical caste theory. The Ministry of External Affairs of France is actively funding a whole project in social sciences to study Indian engineering education. So this is not about improving technology or in, in Indian education um, in engineering, in the engineering field, but it is to study from a sociology standpoint. And this is where they bring in ideas of caste as capital. Yeah, for a peer Bordeaux's ideas. Namaste. It's a it's an honor to be before such a large audience of people who are very interested in this subject. And I thank all the organizers, especially Ratanji, who've known me for a long time. <clears throat> and I'm glad to be here with Vijaya, who's been fellow traveler on this journey doing research and presenting and arguing and fighting and so on. This is the 13th book that I've written. I have another 20 books to write. 20. Now you may think this is not possible, but most of the work has been done, but I haven't published it. So, so I, I'm working with some editors to put it together into volumes. Now, None of these books is repeating what's in the previous books. The idea is to take on a different topic. So it's important and I'm glad that uh, I've been asked to summarize the latest books, which are co-authored with Vijaya. The previous books, one called Breaking India, many of you might know about, talked about forces that are breaking India at the grassroots level, at the level of villagers, poor villagers who are uneducated, trying to convert them, trying to turn them into this Aryan Dravidian divide, using Maoism and things like that, which is still going on. It hasn't stopped. But those forces did not target the elite. They did not target the top people in government or in planning commission like Nitya Yog or ministries. They did not tra target the sons and daughters of the rich, elite, well-educated you know, people in the upper echelon of society. They did not target the industrialists. But the new book talks about threats which are at the top level of society. That is why 
what you have heard about the old issues is not that not what we're going to talk about. Those are old issues. But there are new issues which have not been taken note in India. They've been coming from the Western world two ways. One is through academic work that starts in Harvard and then it comes to Ashoka University, Kriya University, Godrej Lab, TIS, these kind of places, many, many others. And then it spreads to society. And the second path is through corporates. Now, this will surprise you because Bombay is the headquarters of corporate people. So, it will surprise you being in Bombay, which is the headquarters of the corporate India, that corporate India is now being colonized in a very different way. In fact, like the snakes are not visible in the Ganga, this particular poison is not visible to the corporate people. And I will talk to you about it. So this is important to understand what it is, without which you can't really do any Q&A. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the theoretical framework, which is new. We are not talking about Christian evangelism. That is an old framework we already know about. I haven't come to talk about that. We're not talking about, you know, Maoism and all that in the villages. We're not, that we already know about. I'm not going to talk to you about Davidianism. We already know about that. There are new frameworks and we need to understand them. Now, you might wonder what is the importance of frameworks? Why should I worry about frameworks? So, let me tell you what a framework is. If you go to a very remote part of the world where they are not scientific, if there is lightning, they don't know how to explain it. And they just think they have come up with all kinds of explanations, but nothing scientific. And they just react to it. And when they hear, see another lightning, then they react again. They do not have a framework of electricity. They do not understand that this is, this is how it's happening. They don't understand natural phenomena because they don't have a framework. Suppose somebody does not know the concept of a metro. And he comes and he sees that there is this big cement tower they're making. And he says, what is this all about? There's nothing on top. He's just making a big tower. Suppose there's a construction going on. And then a little bit later he goes, he sees another tower. It makes no sense to him because he does not understand that this is all part of a framework called Metro. So the framework you need to understand to understand some people's behavior. Jay Shankar, our Minister of External Affairs, is very good. He reacts to, he reacts to some episode here and there. BBC said something negative, so he reacts. Uh, there is something in Geneva, in Switzerland, something negative going on, he reacts. There is something which the US government said about India not having a democracy and denying rights of freedom, he reacts. But he does not have a framework telling him where is all this coming from. So he is reacting one at a time, one episode at a time. This is a very serious matter. It means that there is no ability to predict. Because you don't have a framework, you can't predict. Nor can you really understand how to solve the root problem. So if you have a medical issue, and each time you go to a doctor, he just suppresses that issue, he reacts to that issue. You know, it's, it's okay, but he's not going to solve the root problem unless he understands what is the, what is the, the, the proper diagnosis of the issue. So the theory that we're going to talk about is a deep understanding of where these problems are coming from. Why is there so much attack on India, on the government, who's behind it, what is the goal? You need to understand the framework. And this framework takes a lot of time to explain. It is not a 10 minute job that I have been given. Without the framework, we can just keep talking about, you know, we are great, everybody is a problem, sab log bure hai, hum achche hai. But for that, you don't need to do new research. We knew that five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, we knew all that. So the the new discovery we've made in these books are things that did not exist on the other side. The enemy is advancing more and more. They are not doing the same thing. Their technology is different. They did not have artificial intelligence. They did not have this same kind of uh, technological way of uh, brainwashing people. They did not have the new theories and frameworks that we have we now discovered. 
So this is the reason for intelligent people who are interested in understanding the, the issues that India faces. This is why it's very important to understand the what is the root problem from which all these things are happening. So since it is a short time, short bit time only, let me just give you a summary. All of you know Marxism generally, maybe you don't know too well, but you understand it. It deals with economic oppressor and oppressed, economic stratification, economic, not religious, not racial. In, in Marxism, it's not about race or religion. It's about economic uh, haves and have nots. You would not think that United States would incorporate Marxism because it's the last place in the world that would invite Marxism. But in the last few decades, Marxism became Americanized. This is a very big thing, very big point that few people in India understand. The Americanization of Marxism by applying it to race rather than to economics. So this business of interpreting black oppression by whites with Marxist theory and therefore saying that the structures should be dismantled. The structures of oppression which the white, whites have created need to be dismantled is Marxism, but instead of economics, it's applied to race. This became known as critical race theory, which is a very big thing in America. It, it's tearing the country apart between the extreme left and the extreme right and very little middle way left. And this is also called wokeism. Now, why is this important? Because the second story, the first is the Americanization of Marxism. The second story affects India. The second story is the Indianization of race. The Indianization of race. We don't have concept of race. We have concept of jati, which is very different than race. Race, you know, the blacks came from a different con continent than the whites. You can tell who's which race. But jati is, we're all Indians. All the jatis are from here only. They look the same, they eat the same. So the imposition, the imposition of race onto jati is the new thing, which people here are not understanding very much, but it is spreading like wildfire. Dalits are the blacks of India, and non-Dalits are the whites of India, and caste is like racism. This is the new critical caste theory. It's come out of Harvard, it's a very big deal. It's spread like wildfire. It's in India. Your Supreme Court Chief Justice quotes it. Chandrachud quotes this. He quotes Harvard people. He mentions them by name. He talks about critical race theory. He applies it to caste. He applies it to Dalits. He, he talks about reparations. He talks about dismantling old structures. All the Marxism applied to critical race theory now being applied to critical caste theory is in the Supreme Court, so you cannot say it does not affect us. You cannot say, ki baat hai, aap log kar rahe hai, humko kya? you have to worry about it. This critical caste theory coming out of Harvard has also been applied to IITs. So we have a book here called uh, Battle for IITs. It's available there, Battle for IITs. And Battle for IITs basically says, how the Harvard people have, have attacked IIT as and all engineering colleges as caste privilege. That this is basically perpetuating caste privilege and what is called merit is not really merit, it's a sham. In the name of merit, they are promoting upper caste and suppressing Dalits. This is their logic. Now we know it's not true, but when Harvard says it, Harvard University Press publishes it, people believe it. And it has gone around the world. It is part of the Harvard curriculum. It's part of the curriculum in all the big universities in the United States and in India. And in India. You go to TIS and you will find it full of that. You go to many places in IIT Bombay, you will find it that. In the humanities and social science department, you will find it there. So it's not just JNU that we keep talking about. In fact, JNU has cleaned up quite a bit in recent years. But this is pervasive throughout Indian education. So this business has now resulted in lawsuits in Silicon Valley against people, play, companies like Cisco, where a lot of Indian tech workers are employed, that these tech workers are bringing caste and racism from India. These tech workers are bringing casteism and racism from India, and now there is a prejudice against 
uh, Dalits and uh, minorities in United States by these Brahmins. So the idea is, so they lost suit against a Brahmin in Cisco that he is oppressing lower caste people in Cisco. And of course, Cisco has to defend it. So this has become a very big thing throughout the United States. Not only tech workers in Silicon Valley, but people in the auto industry, people in pharmaceutical, people in financial industry, also World Bank, United Nations, whole lot of organizations in the United States are now in, into this business of caste sensitivity training. Everybody is being asked to learn about caste and why it's horrible and Hindus have caste. So they basically targeted India and Hindus as a topic of a very hard kind of social injustice. These are the people bringing bad social structures into the United States. They should be stopped. They should be curtailed. There are some people calling for uh, uh, caste, or caste quotas for H-1B visa, for the visa from here. So you see, this is become spread and, and people here don't want to know, don't care to know and we want them to know. Now, these policies that the American multinationals are incorporating in their, is called DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion. Under that name in the HR department, they are bringing these kind of policies. And those companies are now going to start implementing these policies in their Indian subsidiaries. So all these Microsoft India, Google India, Facebook India, all the Indian subsidiaries, plus TCS, which is outsourcing, Americans will require that you have to comply with our laws on caste. American laws on caste, American laws on caste will apply to India. Not Indian laws on caste, American laws on caste, which are race, about racism, equating caste as racism is their law on caste. Those laws on caste through the American multinationals are coming to India and not just tech, but all the industries. And so this is coming also through human rights. It's, it's coming in the European Union. So this uh, expansion of uh, uh, American racial uh, problems, projecting, the, exporting them over to other countries, India is the main target. India is the main target. Now, now another very big story in this book is that Bombay industrialists, are funding this research at Harvard. Mahindra Humanities Center. Mr. Mahindra is a nice man. I have met him once or twice. I have no personal argument. But in his name and with his money is, is this Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard, whose director with that business card called Mahindra's Humanities Center director is one of the worst scholars in the world in terms of attacking Hinduism, India, attacking India's democracy, attacking the, the legit, legitimacy of India as a nation state, he's right there. And either Mr. Mahindra doesn't know or he doesn't want to know. But whatever it is, it's, it's a disgrace because an industrialist should know what is happening with his money, especially if it violates his own values. There is a Lakshmi Mittal and Family Institute for South Asia Studies at Harvard which is promoting conferences and in these conferences come Khalistanis, come Kashmir separatists, come all kind of people, you know, uh, so-called uh, freedom of liber uh, this kind of uh, social justice type people and they're attacking India. There is a, a Ajay Piramal group there in Harvard. There is Tata's, there is Bajaj, there are many and we've named them. There is a separate chapter on Mahindra Center, a separate chapter on Lakshmi Mittal, a separate chapter on Ajay Piramal and so on in this book. And we invite them to come and discuss with us. We would like them to come and discuss with us. They have not wanted to so far. We've tried for quite some time and we continue trying. Uh, Ratanji has been trying also to see if we can have a meeting with them. So whatever the reasons might be, the end result of what they are doing is not happy and not friendly for India. This is a very big story. This story should come out rather than some old type of old issues. Do you know one of the worst scholars in the Western world attacking Hindu dharma, Hinduism, Saffronism, Hindutva is a Professor Hansen. That's his name, Professor Hansen. And you know what is his official title? Reliance Dhirubhai Ambani Professor at Stanford. That's his title. It's Reliance money, Mokesh Ambani money, and his father's name being used 
by a professor who publishes the most nonsensical stuff about India. It's public. It's not like I'm saying something on their website, on their books. You can download this. We've given you, uh, we've given you the evidence. We can show you. Just Google Hanson and Dhirubhai Ambani, uh, Reliance Dhirubhai Ambani professor, and you will see his website. Then you start looking at his books and his articles. Go and Google his articles. You will see such venom towards our culture. Now, this is important for you to know. I mean, we could keep sitting here talking about the same old thing that we are, you know, the great and we, everybody else, yeah, wo prana. but it has become like this. You have, to, you have to fight the Kurukshetra in its current state, not how the Kurukshetra was. Kurukshetra is not static. The enemy is not sitting still. They have now infiltrated the government. Some of these people have now infiltrated Niti Ayog. We are mentioning their names. And a lot of the American consultants are bringing in certain standards of social justice. When they say social justice, it should raise a red flag. Social justice according to whom? According to us, we have a so so certain society. Our society, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, how you do social justice is our way. It is not their idea of social justice. So their idea of social justice is coming in through Ernst & Young, Deloitte, PricewaterhouseCooper, McKinsey, and these are the big shots that come to Bombay and all of you guys from the corporate sector invite them and they are wow, 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 whatever they say is like Bhagwan. But you guys have not done your due diligence, you have not done the Purva Paksha, which our tradition says you have to do in order to understand what exactly they are promoting. So this, uh, this is a long subject, I, I'll have, I want to take questions from the audience because I don't want to uh, focus on premeditated questions that are not relevant to this topic. This is what we have discovered. This is a discovery. We made a discovery and we want to share this discovery with you. Now, I think I would like to request Vijaya to complete the story because Vijaya knows how this is affecting India, how all this starting in the United States has entered India. So, Vijaya, please start. Uh, namaste and thank you for having us. Uh, quickly, what I want to tell you is, uh, it's all pervasive in India. <clears throat> in fact, uh, Furness Ji talked about moving from hydrocarbon to hydrogen, but in the name of sustainability and environmental uh, sustainability, you have a lot of these critical race theory ideas coming into the corporate world, coming into NGOs, coming into the government, right? So, um, first of all, let's talk about educational institutions. Um, the new education policy has brought in the, uh, you know, has opened the floodgates for foreign institutions to set up shop. The reason being that there are lots of Indians uh, who are spending, uh, you know, thousands of dollars to send their children overseas. And so if we invite foreign universities to come here and set up shop, then the foreign exchange doesn't go out and they can do this right in, um, in the motherland. But the problem is, uh, liberal arts universities are coming. We have to first find out what does liberal arts mean. Like everything that the left, you know, puts out, there's nothing liberal about liberal arts. There is nothing, you know, when you have DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's nothing about diversity. It just means a diversity of a certain kind. There's, and equity is not equality, although it sounds the same. And inclusion means including some people by excluding some others. So the definition is very, very important when you look at these sorts of nice sounding words that you see in corporate jargon and that you see um, overall in the newspapers like sustainability 2030, UNESCO's 2030, you know, the UN's 2030 agenda on sustainability. So lots of lots of rubbish is hidden inside this. These are breaking India forces hidden inside this. So there's a whole, the last part of the book is, is about these big organizations like World Economic Forum, the United Nations. Um, the long and short of it would be that we should scrutinize these relationships and perhaps even divorce our connections with the United Nations. So that's the last part. But getting back to education, so we have the education policy where we're bringing in these liberal arts uh, colleges. They're going to be teaching Western social sciences, like Rajiv Ji said. So we're going to be having a force multiplier of bringing Western universities teaching 
uh, you know can they, they have they have no rules like our local institutions so they can charge any amount of fee they can do anything they can teach anything they have total freedom and uh, compared to ugc norms imposed on local institutions so that's number one it's not a fair uh, level playing field and secondly the uh, western social sciences are going to be taught now to give a glimpse of what western social sciences entails we detail a whole section on ashoka university it is sort of the premium social uh, liberal arts university it considers itself the harvard of india um, and you know if we we look at five different departments very briefly in the book because we had so much research uh, and we wanted to give you a snapshot of what this entails so quickly i will just go through ashoka so that you under, you understand what this entails so ashoka has a china studies program the china studies program has lots of links to the ccp and china and this is china's way of educating indian scholars on how china should be viewed and ashoka is the distribution channel it brings in scholars from jadavpur university somaya college uh, christ college in bangalore all kinds of uni uh, other universities in the south and channels them to ashoka and sends them over to china now the same ashoka university had a conference in china it was called the shanghai meritocracy workshop it was a collaboration between harvard university uh, ashoka university and it was held in china this was our talking about meritocracy in the past and in the present of course the chinese are very proud of the history of meritocracy and their current state of meritocracy and how they excel in all fields whereas uh, scholars from ashoka talked about how meritocracy is uh, born out of caste about it, it came from the privileged caste and and spun it in a way that that demeaned india and um, essentially they said meritocracy was a sham and we should dismantle it so this same this same idea is what has gone into the research on the iits and the research on the iit is also a harvard uh, idea but it started in 2010 um when uh, you know with the french government so this book also shows you some of these national security issues that india is having the ministry of external affairs of france is actively funding a whole project in social sciences to study indian engineering education so this is not about improving technology or in, in indian education um in engineering in the engineering field but it is to study from a sociology standpoint and this is where they bring in ideas of caste as capital yeah a peer bordeaux idea so the first mapping of western social sciences was done around in around 2010 or 12 around that time frame with delhi university they trained a lot of indian scholars and uh, had a conference uh to to map peer bordeaux idea of you know of uh, of culture as capital and, and made culture as caste in the indian context and so caste as social capital was born and of course later harvard university came hijacked the idea and and then applied critical race theory and lo and behold now we are at the position where the iits are under attack they want to dismantle the iits and uh, and we are all scrambling because all the stakeholders are are affected the students uh, they don't want they want to get get out of the jee exams because they think that's casteist uh, the upper caste have devised this so called merit uh, which is very virtue sounding that's uh, that's what they say and they want to get rid of all the um, the entrance exam uh, the supreme court justice also seems to be aligned with that idea uh and th then it affects the professors and the hiring of uh, you know of professors to teach the uh, students because the professors are considered casteist and of course uh, alumni like rajiv ji said equality labs and uh, there are other ngos that are going after the alumni of iit saying that um, they are practicing caste bias in the workplace so this is a real problem it's happening so when you get to ashoka university the um, gender studies department is also bringing in in the name of critical race theory it's bringing in gender ideology queer theory um and um, uh, you know these sorts of uh, radical gender theory into into the curriculum uh, for example they think pornography is a good idea in education children should be exposed to pornography believe it or not the ncert has such experts who claim these things 
as you know, experts advising the NCRT to make things inclusive. So this is what I mean when you hear the word inclusive, everybody's for inclusion. But these are the ideologies that are coming in and Ashoka is of course the pioneer in this. They, they also want to have um, people who engage in uh, deviant sexual practices uh, and normalize them. So a parent that spends 40 lakhs for four years in Ashoka University, their children are learning all this. Not only that, they are becoming activists. And the worst part is this is entering the NCRT curriculum through the new education policy. So this is the, the you know, this is the problem. So we did China studies, we did gender, uh, gender and sexuality studies in Ashoka. We'll briefly touch upon behavioral sciences. There's, this, there's one department that wants to change the behavior of Indians because the normal Indian believes in, you know, karma and sharanagati and things like that. And they want to know how can we control and manipulate their actions using behavioral theory. So there's an AI. So there's one group that's doing that. Another group, of course, um, it's called another department in Ashoka is called Trivedi, Trivedi Center of Political Data. They're not even about political science, they're about political data. So this is a wholesale mining of Indian elections, right, election data. And this is again a French Ministry of External Affairs uh, funded project. And all this data on every election from the panchayat level up to the parliament level, everything is in, in a database hosted in some French uh, institute. Yeah. And uh, so this is again dangerous because we have a whole lot of data that makes India vulnerable. So I can go on about all these different departments uh, in Ashoka and that constitutes liberal arts. And so, therefore, this is very dangerous. In fact, Kriya University is a, the, you know, the Ashoka of the South, if you will. Again, very well funded by the billionaires of India. And what Kriya is doing has a partnership with MIT. One would think that the partnership with MIT would give you space technology or nuclear technology or something like that, but it's nothing about technology because one would think MIT you know, is at the cutting edge of science and technology. But we are not getting that from uh, MIT. In fact, a Saudi funded project on eradicating poverty in India. That's the area they're working on. And not many know that Saudi Arabia itself has 25% of its people population living under the poverty line. But here are the Saudis funding MIT to work on India's poverty, right? And uh, so Kriya University is sort of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the scholars at, you know, the uh, outpost for MIT. And uh, they, again, they want to, for example, one of the projects is on why are upper caste Hindu women not going to work when they get married and have a family? How do we change this? So maybe the, the male, the Hindu male is patriarchal and oppressive. So these are the kinds of things that, are, that is being studied. Not, we are not getting space technology or any of that. So the couple of liberal arts universities that have come up with, Indi with Indian billionaires funding uh, have terrible results. The last thing I want to tell you about education is that social sciences in the US itself hasn't produced results. Uh, the kids that get out of social sciences come out with debt, a quarter million dollar debt because that's what it takes for a social sciences um, four year education. And they don't get jobs because they have no value added skills. Anything ending with studies, these are all sort of fake subjects which with uh, no grounding in science or rational thinking. So these are, pe these are people who are not getting jobs. So before we bring in and invite these kinds of studies into India, one should ask what is the benefit? How are they doing in, you know, uh, in their own homeland, if you will? In fact, you can look at Singapore. Singapore had a 10-year a, a relationship with Yale University, 2014 to 24. They were smart. They had a 10-year MOU. And at the end of, you know, in 2020, they said, this is the last year. Four years later, we're cutting it off. 2024, they said, we don't want this Yale and US partnership anymore. It's making Singaporeans uh, very divisive. We don't, these ideologies don't sit well with our culture and our society. And therefore, thank you very much. And they're shaking hands to you. Yale universities and university and saying no more of this. So this is how other countries are proactively dealing with these kinds of issues. Whereas India mm. is going, you know, open arms, you know, to embrace anything that comes from the West. So I think we still are colonized. We have a long way to go uh, and we are compromised. We're colonized and we are compromised. So um, with that, I will 
uh, in my so, so i want to uh, make one more point just one more point the points of all this breaking india stuff is coming into india through three points it is not like before villages of tamil nadu chatisgarh maoists here and there christian missionaries that is the breaking india 1.0 which is also happening but this is breaking india 2.0 it's coming through three entry points mumbai which was not the uh, uh, headquarters of uh, the old breaking india but now in breaking india 2.0 mumbai delhi and bangalore and let me tell you what it means mumbai it's the corporate sector first the corporate lot of corporate in, people in india have been sucked into places like harvard stanford all that and to give money there to do studies on india as if they know better what a stupid thing why would you pay money to other people to study us our history what is wrong with our culture what is wrong with our society are we democracy not democracy what is the index of freedom do we have religious freedom or not those people are studying all these negative things about us in the social sciences who are they to study why do they have the adhikar why have we given them the adhikar it is such a foolish thing to do they should be uh, investing that in india to study create uh, uh, you know programs in india to study india india should be studied in india by indians it should not be studied by foreign institutions who have a history of uh, dislike and bias and all that so this is a very stupid thing happening that our our, our bill billionaires are sucked into it it's fashionable maybe they feel like they become like honorary whites or maybe they feel like uh, they're sitting at the table with warren buffett and feeling very proud they can show off they can tell oh mai to harvard ja raha hu i'm going to go to davos with the on bill gates private jet all kind of nonsense they have inferiority complex maybe that's what they are they want to be in the white man's world so it's fashionable so this is one thing second thing is using this connection the these foreign ideologies are coming through the corporate sector hr department esg esg and within the the s part of esg s is societal social justice that is to do with all this caste mein problem hai minorities ka problem hai lgbtq ka problem hai using social justice as a way to break into all of these kind of issues in india and creating new laws new policies in the corporate sector so the corporate sector is now a place where these foreign ideologies are well established there are certification programs if you want to be da dei officer you go and take a certification program one of these guys is teaching it and they're teaching their point of view our young boys and girls are going and getting certified they're feeling very happy ke mere ko wahan se certificate mil gaya wahan se certificate mil gaya and so by certifying by using their certificate programs to certify our people they are putting their ideology into our into the corporate sector they are have developing an index now the latest thing is you would be surprised to see this there is this uh, uh, this uh, uh, business freedom religious uh, religious freedom business foundation religious freedom business foundation in american which has deep roots on in uh, uh, christianity and uh, evangelism and all of that stuff they have come up with a index of religious freedom and based on this index of religious freedom which is their criteria their questionnaire they are evaluating all the companies to see who has more religious freedom and they are come to india now and they are going to have a big uh, conference in september with indian corporates so indian corporates will be told that you join us and we'll teach you we'll teach you about religious freedom as if india needs to learn from them about religious freedom so now when they have their when they have planted their people they will be the watchdogs they will be the monitors they will be doing the surveillance they will be sending reports on religious freedom religious violation and if if somebody if somebody complains i'm a minority they did not allow me to do this or they did not allow me to do that you may be reliance you may be ambani you may be mahindra anybody but you will be in trouble you will be on the scanner internationally and you have allowed this to happen you have been foolish to allow those people to come and set up a base in your company right in the hr department and without checking out what exactly they're trying to do what they have done in other countries and so this is like inviting the east india company to come and set up headquarters ke hamare hamare country mein hamare desh mein aake aap headquarter laga do kyunki aapko zyada pata hai this is the new civilizing mission it used to be east india company coming and saying we'll civilize you that is why we are here now it is the new american civilization civilizing mission our corporates have entered this field in the last 5 8 years in a very big way 
and they don't want to admit it because it's maybe too late, maybe too embarrassing. So we are in trouble. Number two is Delhi. In the in the Mirti Ayog, in the Ministry of uh, Education, she mentioned about the NEP policy. I know I, I know there is a data privacy huge issue about data privacy. This book on artificial intelligence, this is available there, artificial intelligence and the future of power. This talks about how vulnerable we are to these new uh, new platforms that are coming into India, you know, by uh, foreign platforms for artificial intelligence, gathering data, doing surveillance, chat GPT, uh, you know, these search engines, all these, how much data they are gathering. So the data privacy in many countries is a policy which is meant to stop that. But in India, the data privacy laws have not been passed, but the drafts have been, have been written by these foreign consultants. We are supposed to protect ourselves from them, but they are drafting the laws. The reason they are drafting the laws is because our, our Niti Aayog and other people are not that able to think independently. They are too much in the pocket, they are too much in the uh, eating out of the hands of foreign consultants. So what you do, in you, if you are a ministry, you hire some foreign consultant, they come and write you nice fancy charts, diagrams and whatnot. And because the foreign consultants send an Indian, they always send an Indian with a Hindu name, our people think he's one of us. The point is, as an individual, he's one of us, but he's working for them. He's working for them. I mean, the Zamindars were working for the British. So, you know, this is very silly. We think that just because an Indian comes, just because it's Sundar Pichai, Sundar Pichai is working for Google. He's an Indian, he, he can come and do all the dance once and whatnot, but his loyalty and his, is to his company. He has to, he, he's working for them, there's no doubt about that. He would never deny that. So, we are, we are being sold out to American consultants, indexes measuring us, people writing our policies, our policies for us, because our people do not have the brains or intelligence or whatever it is, I'm surprised, because we're an intelligent society. So that's the second point of entry. Third is Bangalore. Bangalore, there are uh, organizations, in the, um, there's an American organization called Omidyar. You might never even heard of it. You heard of George Soros. Many of you heard of George Soros and what kind of problem he's creating in India. But Omidyar is more, has more billions, half the age, very tech savvy. And he is bringing, he's worse than George Soros. He's George Soros 2.0. And he's bringing that through investments in silica, in, uh, in Bangalore, investments in technology, in uh, startups, artificial intelligence type, new technology, and he's got $500 million invested in India, and nobody has put him on the scanner as of now. So this is an entry of this new, this, and they're into uh, youth empowerment for social justice. So they on the one hand, they're writing software to uh, go and help some villages or whatever, but then there, the message is that the idea is to promote social justice, which should be a red flag. Whenever you see, whenever you see some foreigner trying to teach you social justice or religious freedom, you should say, "Aha! I, I better be careful." You see. So these are the three main points of entry which were not there before. Five, ten years ago, we could not have said that these things have become so are so serious. But today they are very serious, and we've come all the way to Bombay not to talk about old problems that you already know about but to alert you to something new, which the elites of Bombay are in denial, and you, the arms, arms, Ajmi, the Samaj, have to do something about it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rajivji. Thank you very much, Vijayaji. Thank you, Kiranji, for this conversation. Although this was not part of my script, but I sincerely feel that what was the topic for all, all, at least two days of discussions uh, we were forced to have it in a couple of hours and or maybe even less than that and uh, it's given us a lot of food for thought and a lot of actionables. I hope that we will get into that. Uh, with this, uh, we move to the next agenda item is to republish the book uh, Snakes in the Ganga. We request all the dignitaries to come on the dais and uh, do the late thing.
as I said before, we wish to felicitate Shri Rajiv Malhotra for his outstanding work in the field of Indic philosophy. Uh, I request Amir Chitare to read the citation, please. Good evening. I consider this opportunity as my honor that I have been asked to read the citation in honor of Sri Rajiv Ji Malhotra. Respected Sri Rajiv Malhotra, your entire work has been a chronicle dedicated to reposition the prominence of Hindu culture in today's contemporary world. And hence, it is indeed a moment of glory for us that you have graced our minuscule efforts. You had a trailblazing business and entrepreneur career, which is an inspiration for generations of Bharatiya youngsters. Since early days, you have shown a keen academic passion for having an in-depth understanding of Indic studies and Hindu culture. You have donated millions of dollars for academic research, particularly in the Indology domain. You were quite aghast to discover that the funding was being used for biased and agenda-driven propaganda instead of critical academic scholarships. At a young age of 44, you decided to give up your material pursuits and like any ancient Rishi, you decided to devote your life for Dharma, the universal essence of human life. You were instrumental in establishing the Infinity Foundation, which supports intellectual scholarships in leading American universities for research in presenting the true interpretations of ancient Indian religions. You have spent a lifetime of rigorous persistence researching in various concepts and with plethora of books to your credit, you have promoted the divine characteristics of Indic value systems with utmost prominence. You have been one of the first to identify and articulate new threats which are being systematically posed to our ancient civilizations which is just revitalizing after a millennium of aggression and abuse. In spite of facing fierce criticism from the Christianity-inspired Western scholars and the leftist lobby in the United States, you stood unturned and have never been affronted with fallacy in your arguments. On behalf of Thane City, we take this opportunity to felicitate you and acknowledge with deepest gratitude the great work that you have steadfastly done over the last three decades for the renaissance of Dharma. We wish that your great work inspires generations ahead and our ancient civilization achieves the pinnacles of glory for which it was known for in the past. We request Shri Sanjeevji Brahme, Shri Date and Shri Malak to felicitate Dr. Shri Malhotra. Thank you. 